Morning, everyone, and welcome to Research Head Home. So this morning, uh, we have two fantastic speakers uh, who are going to be, to be talking to us about motivation. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of people will be really, really motivated to listen to this. Um, we have Caroline Spaulding, uh, who's a, an English teacher uh, by training, uh, an ex-head of department, uh, and she's a Key Stage 4 lead, I believe, at, the, uh, at this moment. Um, and Peps uh, McRae, who's uh, Dean of Learning Design at uh, um, uh, Ambition Institute. So um, two people who have actually presented quite a bit on motivation. Uh, so they've kind of formed a super team today uh, to discuss that with you. So without further ado, uh, if I just pass it on to you guys. Thank you. Fab. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to your session. Uh, lovely to meet you. Can't see you, but I'm imagining you there sitting back uh, in your garden with the sun beating down, probably too early for a cocktail or a glass of wine, but enjoying whatever drink it is you're enjoying. Um, huge privilege for us to have some time with you this morning. Aware that uh, is busy times in terms of being a teacher. There is lots going on, lots to think about. Um, and so having a bit of time set aside to think about motivation. Uh, with us is just is just a real privilege. Um, today, our goal is to uh, a couple of things to help you understand what motivation is, and to uh, understand how you can influence it best. Um, and by doing that, we hope that not only uh, will you be able to do a better job during this strange lockdown phase, but also when we return to school and beyond that. Um, now today we of course are not going to be able to cover everything to do with motivation but we hope to scratch the surface and create a bit of interest so that you uh, are keen to go on and find out more. Um, now why on earth should you listen to us talk about this? Who are we to uh, come and you know spend take up your valuable attention talking about motivation? Well I'm going to introduce Caroline, wonderful Caroline. So Caroline Spalding uh, who is wearing the, 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 the dotty jumper and who has really effectively coordinated her fern background with me. Well done, Caroline, you're all prepared. Um, so Caroline is hugely credible in this space, has been a, uh, a working in schools uh, for the last 14 years over every possible Ofsted category there has been, uh, is currently working in an all through school, which uh, serves like a highly deprived catchment. Um, Caroline regularly speaks at conferences, is a DFE advisor on multiple things, Women Ed Network Lead, SLT chat host, uh, she has done it all. And so currently assistant head teacher thinking really hard about how to uh, like how to implement motivation effectively in her school because there's a big need for it. Um, final thing to say is she's also a big fan of pro wrestling, went to Japan last year to go and check it out. Uh, not sure whether she is available for wrestling herself. Is that no, no, just can we book in? Just watching. But if anybody does ever want to talk about AEW specifically or NJPW, then my Twitter handle is always open. So what a lovely introduction. Thank you, Peps. And I hugely appreciate being invited by Peps to today. Um, it did stem from a chat over a beer at Future Leaders, me cornering him um, after a brilliant day talking about motivation and basically bent his ear enough, I think, to get the invitation. So thank you. And um, Peps is also very experienced in the classroom, both as teacher, head of department, senior leader. But for the last seven years, he's been senior lecturer at sorry, has been a senior lecturer at university. He also has a ridiculous three master's degrees and is currently completing his doctorate looking at teaching expertise. Um, the reason our paths crossed is because he leads learning design for teaching programs at Ambition Institute. And as I said, I'm a future leaders uh, candidate at the moment. Um, he's written three books, most recently on motivation, and I would just do a plug for that book because it is a brilliant um, introduction to many of the things we're going to talk about today. Great. It's not out yet. Just a little like it's it's your feedback has you know forced me to rewrite it a little bit. So coming September, look out for it then. Great. So just to set the scene a little bit for why we're doing this session, because we've obviously framed it um, with the current situation and with school closures, but really just to say that the science of motivation is always going to be relevant in schools and to teachers. If you've ever taught that year nine class on a windy day, Friday period five, then you will know that education is mandatory, but learning is not. Brilliant Mary Kennedy quote that um, Peps has used at the start of that book that we've just mentioned. So motivation is very much variable, not just between pupils, but actually 
for individual people given different contexts. You know, it's the same reason that when I was at school, I actually was very motivated in my English classes, but kind of less so in my PE lessons. Um, evidence also suggests that motivation decreases throughout pupils' careers. So Helena alluded to the fact I lead Key Stage 4 as part of my role as assistant head teacher, and that's obviously got particular challenges when I'm trying to motivate Year 11 pupils and looking forwards on Year 11, so I even have that motivation of those end, um, sorry, they haven't got the end of year exams currently, and I'm getting lots of calls from parents still trying to get their children to do work at home um, and struggling. But the issues that perhaps are already there are arguably going to be exacerbated by lockdown. So since schools closed on the 20th of March, many of us have found ourselves in really unusual situations and something that we couldn't perhaps foresee and come in. Something for me has been um, creating paper-based home learning plaques. So as Peps talked about, um, I work in an area of high deprivation. Roughly 40% of our pupils haven't got the internet or haven't got a suitable device to do home learning on. So we're obviously providing for them. And one of the images that I won't be able to forget is very much this letterbox and as we go to deliver these home learning pops seeing these tiny little hands creeping out of the letterbox to grab the pack and kind of scurry it back into their home and for me that's obviously an image of kind of humor these golem-esque fingers coming out but it's also that's yes that's my cue to share the slideshow perfect yes. oh there you go love it <laughs> almost like we practiced so for me, this isn't really an image of sort of humour, but also kind of symbolises the anxiety and also the physical separation that um, pupils and their teachers are experiencing currently. You know, quite literally, we don't know what's going on behind those front doors, which has obviously got huge safeguarding implications and clearly implications for learning. But I think what's been less foregrounded today is also the implications of that on motivation. Um, so some or all of our pupils will be experiencing these sort of things. Perhaps next slide. So even if there are home learning, there's going to be a loss of curriculum time and arguably low, low, low attainment when pupils are back in schools, which we know impacts on motivation. There's also likely to be a lack of structure and routine. So I'm sure you've heard the phrase asynchronous learning, which can also have huge um, benefits and positives, but also arguably will impact on motivation. There'll be lack of routine when we're back in the classroom. There's also a weakening of social norms and behaviours that we would find in schools and weakening of social ties. So not just between teacher and pupils, but also those children have not seen their peers um, in face to face or highly unlikely that they have. So there's a weakening of social ties there as well. And finally, a loss of agency and sense of purpose. You know, even I think as adults, we've felt this. Um, a lack of control over the current situation um, and really a loss of the purpose of our day-to-day -day lives. I think I, I certainly have really struggled with. But if, it's, if motivation was already an issue in schools before lockdown, then perhaps we're thinking, well, can't we just apply the same tools to these situations and these problems? You know, if this has been around, as I've said, for as long as the teaching profession has, why haven't we cracked it yet? So question really for PEPs, why is it so difficult to use science to tackle these issues of motivation in schools? Mm, okay, um, good question. Why, like, why do we, I think like in the thing I'd, I'd want to just like call out from what you said earlier is, yeah, not only do we have, like every school has some kids who are motivated, yeah, but a whole bunch of other kids who aren't motivated and then like a big, a big group of, of pupils who we'd really want to be a little bit more motivated. We'd benefit loads from that. Um, so not only that, but also like the evidence, like you say, suggests that there's this kind of like real inexorable decline in, in pupil motivation during their school career. And so it's, 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 it's clearly something we haven't completely cracked yet as a profession. Um, so the question is why? why? Why why on earth? We're all, you know, it's not for lack of trying. Teachers are some of the most committed professionals in the planet and smart. Um, so, so why haven't we quite cracked it yet? And I'd say like when you, when you take a step back and, and look at the evidence and try and understand what's going on, um, you start to get a sense of just how uh, complex and invisible motivation is as a thing. And I think that those two factors, the complexity and the invisibility, mean that it's really hard to, to, get, a, to get a good handle on um, as a profession. I'm not convinced we 
uh, have like a really strong set of common language with which to talk about motivation. And certainly not like a really, you know, go-to set of strategies that we know are dependable and evidence informed to help us or boost that motivation. Um, you know, if you, you think about it, motivation really is a product of, of like, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of years of evolution shaping uh, how we respond to our environment that often um, where, where resources are often highly constrained. There's often like a really fine line between collaborating and competing with, with our groups. Um, and and the, like the outcomes of our actions are often really uncertain. So like, it's no surprise that our motivation has ended up becoming quite a subtle yet like deeply rooted kind of heavily unconscious thing. It's very much like deeply rooted in our brains and our biology guided by you know, some of the stuff in our genes, guided by our hormones, guided by uh, you know, our, 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 the, the chemi chemical reactions going on in, in our body. So um, I think it's probably, when you take a step back, it's probably no surprise that we don't fully understand motivation yet. Um, it is a bit like trying to understand a car engine, I suppose. Uh, you know, without actually like opening up the hood and having a good look inside, we've got no hope. It's just too complex. And the problem is, unless you get a good understanding of what's going on under the, under the hood, you can't really change it. You're not going to be able to improve an engine unless you really understand what's going on there. And so I think that's what we're going to try and achieve today. We're going to try and shine a light under the hood of motivation, get in there and use the lens, the flashlight of science, really pushing this analogy hard here, using that flashlight of science to help us illuminate some of the, the, the kind of concepts around what motivation is and how we influence it. So where do we start with this? So firstly, let's think about what motivation is. So what does the science tell us about what motivation is? Well, firstly, um, the best thing to do in terms, or one of the big ideas is really to think about motivation as a, as a mechanism for how we invest our attention. The world is a hugely busy place. Schools and classrooms are hugely busy places. There's lots of things competing for our attention. Our motivation is perhaps best thought of as the mechanism that tries to triage and ascertain which of those things that are competing for our attention are the best thing for us to invest in. And so it's a kind of economic instrument in some ways, trying to ascertain what's the value of that thing? Is it worth me in investing in it? Motivation is also important to think about as a, like a kind of a localized and malleable, a changeable thing. Um, too, too often we assume that, or we talk about pupils being motivated or not motivated. Hey, that kid over there, they're really motivated, that kid is not. However, what the evidence suggests is that motivation is much more dependent on the local environment, on their experiences, uh, rather than just being a, a fixed trait with them. Um, and so it's important that we, instead of thinking about somebody being motivated or not, thinking about them being motivated in a particular class, on a particular day, by a particular teacher, by a particular subject, for a particular set of reasons. And so as a result, it's something we can really change much more. Um, now, the way that we change motivation um, is not necessarily by trying to reason with someone. Actually, like we talked about earlier, it's, it's a product of you know, a lot, <laughs> some com pretty complex evolution and lots of factors, that many of which are highly unconscious. Um, it, the way we change motivation is by changing the experiences and environment that our pupils encounter. Um, trying to reason with someone to help them understand why they might want to invest more in maths is, is really not going to get us that far. And that's why things like motivational po posters and inspirational quotes uh, don't tend to have a long lasting effect on motivation because they only they work quite on uh, like a conscious rational level whereas actually things that we're going to explore in a little bit have, have a much more sustained and uh, profound effect. And then finally worth noting that, uh, that talking about the relationship between motivation and behavior so motivation is probably best thought as like the an upstream cause of behavior. Uh, behavior is is important or useful for us to talk about it as a profession because it's the thing we can see. However, it's important that we uh, also spend a bit of time thinking and talking about the thing that causes behavior, which is essentially motivation. Motivation is the upstream cause of that behavior. And so if we want to deal with the causes and not just the symptoms, then we're best to, to think about motivation as well as behavior. So these are a set of useful ways to think about motivation. Caroline? I was just going to say that point about being localised and malleable is so important and the best example I can give is why I joined the gym every January and I've given up by, um, by mid-Wednesday. I've got a reason to do it, I'm feeling like I actually want to 
get fitter or just before I book a holiday and then actually that motivation dissipates um, and I think I'm sure we can all relate to that. Absolutely right how many people join the gym on January the 1st <laughs> you know New Year's resolutions are a great example of like it's not just enough for us to want even want to do something uh, there are a whole bunch of other forces that shape what we end up doing whether we end up going to the gym or not um, and so what we're going to do now is, is actually dive into some of those forces um, the, the useful way to talk about them is maybe to think about them as levers that we can use to uh, boost motivation in the classroom. So let's work through them. There are basically five levers that um, kind of fall out of the evidence when you join the dots and you could look across multiple fields such as behavioral economics, evolutionary psychology, uh, educational research, motivation sciences. Um, and so let's just look at uh, these one by one. So first one is securing success. In terms of a lever, this is probably the, the biggest and strongest lever we have at our disposal. Um, thinking back to that idea of motivation being an, an investment, a decision engine based on investment uh, analysis or investment calculus. Um, when we help pupils to feel success, we massively increase the value of that opportunity that's in front of them. Um, when pupils feel success, not only does their proficiency increase, but also their expectancy increases. So what I mean by proficiency is just simply how, how well, how, how, how much they know about that thing and how well they're able to do it. And when our proficiency increases, uh, we end up feeling like uh, we're able to act more in the world. Fluency itself has a really like, good feeling when you can do things well, you feel good about it. Um, it's just, uh, and then there's also an effect of when we, um, have done things before we, we we tell ourselves that there must be there must have been a useful reason to do it so proficiency has, has lots of benefits for lots of reasons um expectancy the other kind of value add that comes with with uh, sowing success or securing success is that um we tend to look back on our previous experience and use that to judge uh, whether something's useful to do in the future. So if in a maths classroom we've been repeatedly successful, then it's likely the next time we walk into a maths classroom, we will think, ah, okay, this is going to be a good investment for me. I'm probably going to get something out of it. Um, now, the, the, the interesting thing about expectancy is that it's, e it's kind of easier to lose it than to gain it. And so a couple of experiences of failure can have a, a really massive impact, a really massive negative impact on somebody's uh, perception of a, a, an academic subject and so we kind of like got to treat that expectancy that proficiency really like really really carefully and so as teachers we should be aiming for a really high success rate now how do we do that um pretty much like boils down to good teaching in many ways okay so we make sure we pitch things at the right level uh, we break things down so people can be successful in small chunks rather than, rather than trying to take on too much and not succeed um, provide lots of scaffolding can really help as well. So essentially lots of aspects of good teaching end up being at the center of what makes pupils more motivated. Uh, Mark Henster wrote a really good TES blog on this, I think it was this week or last week. You should check it out. Um, proficiency, last thing to say around sort of uh, sowing success and proficiency is that proficiency is a much more sustain sustainable route to motivation than uh, something like uh, you know, external rewards, like giving somebody a sticker or some praise, things like that. Because if, as soon as you remove those external rewards, motivation can return back to the base state. Whereas you can't really get rid of proficiency. When somebody has built up the knowledge and fluency of something, that is going to be with them forever. And so it's a kind of a comp it's what's called autocatalytic. Uh, proficiency fuels itself. The more you know and the better you get at something, the more interested and the more valuable you perceive that thing to be. However, securing success is not the only lever that we can pull. And certainly if we just rely on that, we will not fully motivate our pupils. The next one we want to talk about is running routines. Okay, now thinking back to that investment analogy, not only are, are pupils interested in what value they might get out of an experience, but also interested in what that experience might cost them. For example, Caroline, if I said to you, Caroline, I can guarantee that you can have a million dollars uh, you know, you'd be pretty interested in that. However, if I said to you, you're going to have to spend the next 40 years working 24 seven for it and maybe sell your soul to, you know, the world of the stock market, you might think twice about it. So as well as like what, what's valuable to us, it's also really important to think about the cost. Now, the interesting thing about this is that in education, 
we can't really make the learning any easier. Okay, learning by itself is often quite effortful, particularly the stuff we teach in schools. And so the question is, how can we reduce that cost for learners? Now, this is where routines come in, because because what routines can do uh, are basically to reduce the effort in terms of the how, so that pupils can spend more effort on the what. Okay. So as an example, um, if I'm like getting my pupils to ha have a discussion in class, if I use the same discussion framework that I've used the last weeks, the last months, they have to think less about what do I say next or who says something next, and they can think much, much more about the subject that they are learning, which then helps drive that success. So running routines are a really powerful way to reduce the cost, which then increases motivation. Um, there are loads of great routines out there. You just have to look around in some classrooms. Uh, you can also grab some books like Teach Like a Champion by Doug Lamov. He's a great, you know, he's a master of breaking down uh, classroom routines. There are routines for behavior, getting pupils in and set up like efficiently so they don't have to think about that as much. And there are routines for instruction, hosting discussions, asking questions, getting pupils to respond, all those kinds of things. So really good investment in terms of trying to increase motivation. Um, Right, so we've talked about securing success, which increases value, running routines, which reduces cost. However, we are not just economic machines, we're also highly social animals. Caroline has been thinking a lot about this, so I'm going to hand over to her to talk about the next lever for boosting motivation. Great, so humans are social beings. Um, you might have come across the EAST framework developed by the Behaviour Insights team to basically see how the government could sell policies to the public. And it basically said that they needed to make them easy, accessible, social, crucially, and timely. And if you look at something like the lockdown and perhaps the mixed successes, then yeah, absolutely you can see that it's timely and you'd think it'd be relatively easily sitting at home. But perhaps one of the reasons that people have struggled so much with it is because because as I say, we're social creatures. Um, we perhaps don't always like to stop and think about how we are influenced by social norms. That basically means how other people think and behave. You know, certainly uh, throughout my life, I've always sort of thought of myself as relatively rebellious. I was the pink uh, teenager with the pink hair and the Doc Martens ripped tights. But actually increasingly, I've had to kind of acknowledge that, as I said, we are influenced by those around us in innumerable ways. Within schools, perhaps we've foregrounded pupil-teacher relationships as a motivating factor. And certainly if I look at something like trying to get your 11 pupils to your after-school revision sessions, you know, I've heard plenty of times, oh, do it for you, miss. Um, or in English, for example, we found we, when we moved back to actually just seeing our own classes, we we're much more successful. Um, but books like Graham Little's Hidden Lives of Learners do a really good job of articulating and showing us the power of peers um, to influence one another and motivate certain behaviours. There's a great quote, it says, when there's a clash between the peer culture and the teacher's management procedures, the peer culture wins every time. Um, and it's not just about the close ties, you know, best friends and small social groups, you know, the child dragging her mate to revision sessions. It's also about the really loose ties. So seeing the rest of the year group and what they're doing, that they're going to revision, and actually, as teachers, we can tap into this herd mentality, I think, really effectively. So if we can create really visible social norms, which and it works most effectively when we're talking about desirable behaviours, actually not just using this in a, in a negative way, then actually we can create a really powerful motivational lever. Uh, there's a brilliant blog that I continually go back to, it's quite a few years old now, by James Theobald, talking about how to get his class to do um, homework. And he found himself saying, none of you are doing your homework. Um, and he refers to this quote by Robert Cialdini, which basically says, what you're actually saying is um, many people are doing this undesirable thing. And it's a powerful and undercutting normative message. In other words, if you want to fit in, don't do your homework. Mm. So we can flip this. And obviously, if we can foreground, as I said, that most people are doing that desirable behaviour, it can be hugely motivational. Um, now you can see that in, in struggling schools, failing schools, the Matthew effect in action, where pupils are seeing that the norm is not to do um, that desirable behaviour and compound interest in really successful schools, where actually it's incredibly difficult to kind of opt out um, and do not to do the desirable thing. So the language that we use, the messages that we give really do matter. 
So we need to give recent, multiple recent examples of pupils doing the desirable behaviour and we need to over communicate them. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm on Ambition Institute's Future Leaders course and over communication is very much seen as a, a driving factor. I really like it. We can also use what Rachel Johnson calls the Weight Watchers principle. So apparently if you go to Weight Watchers, um, you don't just get celebrated the pound or a couple of pounds that you might have lost. They add up the weight of the group and actually celebrate, you know, we have together lost 25 pounds. And I've done this really successfully in my own school around things like revision, where we celebrate not just the one hour or two hour you've done this week, but wow, this whole year group has, has done 536 or two and a half thousand um, hours of revision over the year. We even got to a stage where we were in competition with the school down the road, which was quite fun. Um, I can see huge um, relevance to this when we look at um, home learning, you know, hours spent on revision platforms and how that can be celebrated. And it's about amplifying the approval from peers. You, you know, you're trying to emphasise it's normal to do this desirable thing. And it's incredibly difficult to actually then place yourself outside of that because ultimately we all want to belong, which brings me on to lever four. So belonging for human beings shapes, shapes health and happiness, not just motivation. And it stems from the idea of affinity, feeling that people are like you. And that affinity often grows from familiarity. So when you're in one another's company for many months or many hours, that feeling of familiarity grows and the affinity grows with it. You know, if you're um, like me, a teacher of a course subject and you see pupils for four or five hours a week or, or a primary school teacher who actually is nearly always with the same class, then you'll know the really strength of bonds that can develop over time. Now, we need to think carefully about how we can build common ground on return to school when particularly with vulnerable pupils might have had incredibly different experiences from us. Now I certainly won't be talking about the many lovely hours I've spent in my garden um, with my vegetable patch and my gin in my hand um, but we can actually find commonalities and actually just talking about the strangest of the situation um, and what it's felt like I think is going to be an important way to bring back that sense of belonging and that common ground. We can think other, about other strategies as well to make sure all pupils feel included. Um, there's keyring there because I think this is a really simple strategy that I've used um, in the past and will continue to do so to create a shared sense of identity across a year group. But I can see it would work across the whole schools or um, classrooms as well. So basically they get their own logo, they get a little slogan to go with it, they carry it with. I actually use it to put um, really key revision details on the back, the password and login for um, the Pixel websites that we use. I'm quite pleased that um, our school happily is introducing blazers when we get back. And actually, I think that's a perfectly timed, it's, I wouldn't say this was strategy, this is an accident, but perfectly timed, going to be kind of visual symbol of our belonging and coming back together as a community. It's also important to communicate your unifying purpose. So, you know, think about your school's motto, values, vision. Um, as I said, we did this across a year group. So we used to work hard, be kind, or the year before that, it was um, do the work, um, which is a wrestling reference patch that you will like, Triple H's um, motto. But they might seem like small things, but actually it's about making pupils feel included. It's also important to think about recognising individual contributions to the group, particularly for those pupils on the edges. So we also give out gold ties for progress. They are entirely hideous, but they really do the work of motivating pupils. And I think one of the reasons for that is because we've kept it around progress. And what it's allowed us to do is really celebrate some of our lower achieving pupils, lower attaining pupils, but actually they've got that visual badge of feeling like they're part of the collective and we are recognising um, the steps and the efforts they're making. So the final lever is about building buy-in. Now there's lots of, um, of evidence to, to talk about the idea of autonomy and choice. So perhaps you refer in your book to um, this great quote that where people feel they have meaningful choice, they will put in more effort, persist for longer and enjoy their learning more. But, you know, clearly that's quite problematic in schools where actually pupils are novices, we're the experts and they're not actually best placed always to make their um, choices related to their own learning. So I think building by for teachers really stems from explaining the why of our decisions. Now, I'm sure lots of people will be familiar with Simon Sinek's work and uh, the golden circle with why at the core. 
in lessons, what we can do as teachers is foreground the immediate benefits of that lesson in a way that's simple and tangible for pupils. You know, we couldn't do this bit of learning when you were at home, or this text or this poem, being an English teacher. We're going to do it now. Don't worry, you know, this will help plug that gap. It's really important that we build trust with pupils between seeing as consistent and credible. And that might mean for us creating certainty where actually we feel quite uncertain at the moment. Um, I think over time, it's really important to share, you know, what's going to happen, when and why. You know, I think the curriculum roadmap, hence the picture, has been perhaps taken a little bit too literally. And you know, we see some incredibly quite complicated visual displays of curriculum now and um, floating around on Twitter and the like. But I do think it's important to create a really powerful story and actually create a narrative for pupils so there is that sense of certainty and expectation. I also really like making sure that pupils can answer the question, you know, why do they want to do well? Um, and we've spent a lot of time in tutor time actually with tutors helping pupils work on that and they're incredibly individual. You know, one I particularly remember was a Slovakian pupil talking about he felt his community had an opportunity, he felt that they often worked in factories and he wanted to actually do better for himself than that. Um, and again, perhaps talks about this idea of an implementation in, intent. Got to get my mouth around that. <laughs> that implementation intention. In other words, getting people to just commit and write it down. And that doesn't have to be anything fancy. For us, it was post-it notes on the form, form wall, uh, full display board. But actually, we ended up returning to that a lot. And again, it gives them that sense of, of choice and purpose and actually that they're going somewhere with all of this. I think we also need to prepare to, when we talk about the why, actually explain the science behind what we're doing and the reasons for our decision. You know, don't be scared to share with them some of the stuff that we've talked about today. So we're working on a tutor time programme to teach them not only the learning strategies, but also the strategies to remain motivated or meta-motivation. So things like self regulation I have strategies around self-regulation, self-talk, self-coaching. Right, I'm going to take a deep breath. Is there anything that I've missed, perhaps? <laughs> no, that's great, Caroline. Like loads <laughs> covered masses amount, really, uh, in a very short space. Thank you. Um, and all, yeah, like really, really interesting. Um, like I think you you pulled out, you, you touched upon one of the reasons I think like motivation is such a challenge in schools because we can't we can't change what 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 we're teaching uh, you know it is naturally effortful and the like the value of learning maths isn't obvious for a like a you know seven-year-old uh, you know they're not there so that they can have a great career in their 40s and, and you know a nice house uh, like the like the value of the stuff we we teach in schools is 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 like really really hard to wrap your head around even as teachers sometimes we find that that difficult to articulate but we know uh, for individuals and for society it's hugely important um, so I think like sometimes as teachers, we can often assume, make assumptions that the value of what we're teaching is obvious. Um, and I suspect we could probably spend a little bit more time uh, just, just pausing and communicating the why, like you said, like this is why we're doing this. This is how it might be of value to you. Uh, and also this is why we're doing it the way we're doing it. Not just the what we're learning, but the how of the learning, uh, explaining the pedagogy behind what we're doing as well. Um, fantastic. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, so we have done a kind of real whirlwind, whirlwind tour of the, the various levers um, that are at our disposable disposal disposal for boosting learning. Um, the first two that I kind of touched on are economic levers in many senses. They're about trying to, uh, you know, unconsciously what we do is we weigh up the value and the cost and the expectancy of the opportunity in front of us and decide whether that's something we want to. Uh, you know, invest our intention in, our very precious, finite attention in. Um, however, that kind of value, that investment calculus is mediated by a bunch of social factors. You know, when somebody else is doing something, it changes our perception of it. Um, whenever we feel that the, those people doing that thing are like us, like we belong to that group, then that increases the, the value even further. And then finally, when we think we have some kind of like ownership over that decision that we're making we're not being coerced into it in any way then again that raises the kind of value for us so overall i think we could sum this up by saying like if we can provide an experience where people's um feel success where they don't feel it's like a massive cost to them where there are other people doing similar things especially people like them who they can relate to and they feel like they are making 
that decision themselves, or at least it's been made on their behalf with, with them in mind, then uh, like those are the basic levers that we can use to um, maximize motivation as much as we possibly can. And so together um, with the kind of four lenses, as you might want to call them, the four lenses and the five levers um, of, of boosting motivation, we have this kind of motivation for, for learning framework. Um, so there you go. That was our plan for today was to introduce you to the kind of science of motivation, what the big ideas are and what the big levers are for influencing it in your school. Um, hopefully that's been, been useful. A um, couple of caveats just to chuck in at this stage. The, the evidence around motivation is nowhere near as strong as the evidence, for example, um, that underpins the science of learning. Um, it's like for the reasons we illustrated earlier around its complexity and invisibility, uh, even the world of research hasn't, mass hasn't managed to like really nail it down yet. There are lots of aspects of science of motivation that have field replication or uh, there's lots of like term overlap, lots of different fields using different language to describe the same things. Um, frankly, it's a bit of a mess, but what we've tried to do today is to pull all of those fields together, join the dots and provide something that hopefully is as robust as possible, given the, uh, the evidence, the best available evidence. Um, and then final caveat is really to say it's none of this is a magic wand that you can just walk into school and go, but damn, I'll do those five things and it'll all magically change. Um, you know, we will be able to hopefully tip the balance a little bit and over time, boost motivation. Uh, we're not going to see any overnight successes by, by bringing this uh, to your situation. However, I do think it is worth pausing and uh, considering asking yourself the questions, how do I currently think about motivation? Do any of these things, any of these blue boxes uh, make me think differently about it, me or the way my colleagues talk about it? And then similarly, the, the navy boxes on the other side, uh, how much, how well do we do these things right now? And are, any, are there any of those levers we can like tweak a little bit harder? So there we go, that's it all for today. Um, just a reminder that if we can do this, uh, there are a whole hu like, huge range of benefits. Uh, not only will we end up with pupils who are uh, better behaved in lessons, they will learn more and their life chances will be increased, but also as teachers, it's probably gonna make our lives a little bit easier and make us more satisfied in the classroom. As a profession, it would take us one step closer to a more evidence-based approach to our work. Um, and of course, the more evidence-based our work is, the more our professional judgment can come into action. So this is a really important kind of step for us as a, as a profession to harness the science of motivation um, to make us, uh, 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 take us closer on our journey towards being like a truly professional profession. Um, if you're interested in hearing more after this, um, then go and check out Ambition website. Lots of great programs on there. Um, uh, we run programs for not only teachers, but school leaders at a range of different levels. Um, you can get in touch with us on Twitter. Really happy to kind of keep this conversation alive. I think it's important to see this as the start of a conversation. Certainly not something we've cracked yet. Certainly there are lots of arguments, I think, that need to be refined and tested and pushed around. So please do get in touch have that conversation with us and anybody else who will listen. Um, and if you're interested in finding out more, if we have scratched that itch and we've got you interested, then I've pulled together a bunch of different readers um, and there's the link at the bottom of the page. There's some great reading out there on motivation uh, from a variety of different sources that I'm sure some of it will be interested to, to various people. So that's us done. Caroline, any last words? Well, we've got some brilliant questions, which would be a perfect opportunity and a little bit of time to go over to them. So there's two that I've picked up around home learning, one of them directed to, um, towards me in a similar school um, where there's a lack of human connection, um, often because they're using paper-based learning, I'm guessing. Um, so I think these levers actually work really well for home learning. So if we go back to Pepsi's points about securing success and running routines, I would say really think about the pitch of, of what you're sending home. So we very much found our best engagement has actually been with some of our lower attaining pupils. Um, actually pupils new to British and secondary education, we've had brilliant work returned back. And when we sort of reflected on why we felt that was, it's because they got work that was very much bespoke to the level that they were working at. 
um, routines as well. So having a really a common understanding of when work's going to be set, when it's expected to be back. I know many schools have worked around that and not trying to mirror perhaps your lesson by lesson cycle. We've moved to a fortnightly cycle that's working very well. I know my own A-level class, we have a routine that goes out on a Monday, it's returned to me by Thursday and then I give them feedback effectively on the Friday. Now the social norms and, and belonging is going to be more challenging. You know, I use that metaphor as it behind the, the door, but your school hopefully by now has worked on a communication strategy. So for us, our form tutors call home every single week, their, tut their tutees supported by other members of staff where there's a slightly larger group. Um, and when we don't get through, we are doing home visits because of the need for that of safeguarding within our context. But think about how you can use those, those communication channels which are open to celebrate success, to maintain those social ties. You know, social media now it, it can be easily used, I think, if if, with a bit of creativity so if you check at Benro school we've got a whole stream of all of the work that's being sent back to us whether it's by email photo through the post and um, I will just add an anecdote that we had one pupil spend six pounds on special delivery to get that work back to us so have a little sent a little note to say please do it second class next time um, but now I do think that there's lots of opportunities um, with these levers and with home learning and if you want to you know Pick my brains on that anymore, please do get in touch via Twitter. Thanks, from Caroline. Uh, I'm going to pick up a question now from Rachel Hersey asks, can we do anything to make ourselves feel more motivated as teachers? Uh, wonderful question. Um, and say like actually the, the framework we've outlined probably works pretty well for ourselves and various other contexts as well. So um, I'm struggling to get my medium plan done. <laughs> so what can we do? Well, let me think about a, a, a more uh, general example and then we can see if we can apply some of that thinking to your medium plan situation. So um, we talked earlier about, uh, you know, it comes to the, often what happens is the start of January, um, based on our New Year's resolutions, we say, right, we're going to get fit. Um, but often these, uh, these aspirations fall by the wayside over uh, time because actually we don't, tap into those experiences and environments that really sustain our motivation, the things we've talked about. So for example, if you really wanted to like, commit to, to exercise and get healthy and get fit, whatever your goal is, then if we think about the, some of the, the levers we've discussed today, what you want to make sure is that you're feeling successful off the bat. So don't go into the gym and aim to like run five miles on your first day and fail miserably and because that's just really not going to help you. Um, similarly, you want to try and make it uh, reduce the cost of that investment as much as possible as well. So, uh, you know, opt for a gym that is near you um, or like just think about how you can make that really easy for yourself. Um, you can also do some stuff like, uh, this is kind of outside the framework, but you can do things that are like, that are called pleasure bundling. Now this stuff doesn't really have work in school, but in this context it might. So for example, uh, researchers have found that uh, you know, if you jump on the treadmill for a while and then you allow yourself to watch like a, one of your favorite videos or have like a, a nice bit of cake afterwards, it kind of like cues, ties those two things together and increases the chance that you'll be happy to jump on the treadmill again in the future. Um, but so possibly some of the biggest levers are those social levers that Caroline talked about. So for example, um, like joining a club where there is some accountability and there's some social norm like influences going on will massively increase the chances that you go out and exercise. So, uh, you know, my wife does British military fitness, this, you know, where you go to the park and get shouted up by somebody to, to work out. Um, you know, there's no, you're not paying for the gym kit. You're not paying for anything. Really what you're paying for is that kind of social accountability. And she goes to that religiously far more than she ever would have uh, just for the gym because of that strong social norm and feeling of belonging as well. She's part of that group. She has a role to play. She knows that she has to turn up and support her partner. Um, and so in terms of your medium term plan, I think like maybe the one thing that we can try and drag out of all of this is um, I, I, we tend to find it easy to do things we enjoy. So if you can figure out a way to make your medium term planning enjoyable, then it's much more likely that you will be motivated to do it. Great, so I put it to a question about year nine. What is it about year nine? I hear them mention it's a difficult year group to work 
with and commonly unmotivated. Um, I, I'd throw in a year eight personally as well. And just to come back to something that we mentioned earlier, there is evidence around um, decreasing motivation during a a child's um, journey through schools. But just to come back to what I was saying really about purpose, if we think about year nines, most schools still have a key stage three that lasts for three years. And really at the end of that journey, I haven't begun um, that vital key stage four GCSE journey. So I, I would argue that perhaps it's considering how we're selling year nine, you know, what the purpose is and how we're articulating that. But also, you know, perhaps alluded earlier to the biological factors around motivation and arguably year nine is where we've got hormones and all other things and biology hitting. Perhaps there's anything you want to add about that? Year nine, yeah, yeah. Um, 13 years old, long time ago for the pair of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do think like this is, uh, there, is there, there are basically a lot of, for, for you, you know, you imagine yourself as a, as a year nine. Um, there are a lot of really powerful forces in action uh, that are influencing where you direct your attention. So, for example, if you, uh, you know, you have you, Caroline, at the front of this class saying, hey, you know, this, like, pay attention to this particular, you know. Sonnet, there we go. Yeah, yeah, sonnet, whatever it is. Um, whereas at the same time, like there's somebody, there is a, a very popular pupil over the other side of the class who is going to judge you negatively and actually potentially reduce your status in the group or even oust you in terms of belonging. If you answer the question competently, then actually the, 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 those two influences are, are competing massively and the, the kind of like the unconscious social influence is going to completely overpower the, the rational eye. Oh, I want to, to learn this on it. And so we've got to make sure that the different levers are aligned as much as possible because when you have some of the levers competing with other levers you kind of yeah you, like things don't really work uh, as well and i think for year nine probably some of those levers are more um more like more powerful than other levers um okay uh, i'm gonna pick up on maybe if we do like two more questions all right Caroline? okay so i will pick up on one here um, from Jenny Shipway, how important is it to spark general curiosity about a topic as a way to motivate people to want to learn? Yes, Jenny, this is something that I kind of failed to touch on earlier when I was trying to find my notes around the proficiency piece. Um, but definitely like one of the uh, one of the really important things we can do as teachers is, is to spark that curiosity. Hopefully we've achieved that a little bit today. Um, the important thing I think to remember is that curiosity grows with your understanding and knowledge and proficiency so the more you know about something the more curious you tend to become about it so if you can about anything in your life you're interested in acting about it's likely that you probably know a lot about that and so our kind of number one strategy or one of the number one strategies that we can deploy as teachers to help our pupils to become more curious is to help them know more about that thing become more proficient so again, it's one of these autocatalytic self-reinforcing effects that you get when you focus on proficiency from the, like the core thing, helping pupils to value and get better at that even more. Caroline, final question. Right, I really like this question about marking. So um, Emily asked, most teachers believe marking motivates students. Is this true? I'm trying to move from marking a face on feedback. So I'm gonna presume that means written marking um, in books, kind of traditional style. So. I mean, perhaps I'm sure we'll, we'll chip in with um, this kind of science and the research angle, but if I sort of step back to what I was saying about recognising individual contributions, then arguably that's, if there is a motivating factor, possibly where it stems from, you know, the feeling that my teachers read this, acknowledged my hard work, um, that's going to be motivational. But I don't think personally it's tied to written marking as a form. You know, I frequently use whole class feedback um, and just as easily I make a note of particularly individual contributions we frequently use the visualizer and there's other ways of acknowledging people work which arguably have a far less damaging impact on teacher workload so I think it's coming back to um, if it motivates why and then actually thinking about how you can build that into your teaching as well perhaps anything to add nope covered it Beautifully, Caroline. Um, I'm just going to pick up, I'm going to steal one last question here. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, 
um, uh, let me just check and pronounce it right. Uh, Yesim, sorry, apologies. Yesim has asked, uh, like I, he's been tasked, or she's been tasked with reporting back to the, the school about what they've learned. Um, and so just to say, the yes, SM that there is on that that link, pepsmacrae.com slash motivation, I've added some of those images that we shared today. Uh, and so I think your key takeaways could very easily be those like four ways to think about motivation and the five levers. Um, and I think taking those back is a really good start. Also, of course, going and pre-ordering my book for you and all of your colleagues, you know, necessity, absolute, you know, first thing you need to be doing after all of this. Q, QLN before I start like shamelessly promoting too much. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just wondering if um, if you if you're done really or if you wanted to tackle the final one. But um, uh, I think you've covered so much this morning. Uh, literally pages of notes, and it's been really really useful. Um, and just just checking the, the feedback on Twitter. People are really enjoying this as well. So thank you enormously for this session this morning. Uh, it's really well structured, uh, lots of takeaways. Um, have a lovely day. Uh, thank you very much. I, I will send you the questions just in case you wanted to just perhaps think about a couple more. Um, but in the meantime, um, have a great day. And I'm just going to uh, warn people that tomorrow we are uh, back at 11 with uh, Eric Callens. So another great session in store for everyone. Um, have a lovely day, Pat. Have a lovely, lovely day, Carolyn. Uh, and thank you very much for the session. Pleasure. Thank Bye you. Bye, everyone. Thanks for having us. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.